Good afternoon. Welcome to Future Security Forum 2022 and our panel on how the U.S. should respond to disinformation. My name is Genevieve Lester. I'm the DeSario Chair of Strategic Intelligence at the U.S. Army War College, and I'm joined by two fabulous guests who are experts on this particular issue. Beth Sanner, former Deputy Director of National Intelligence for Mission Integration, former Director of the President's Daily Brief and Senior Fellow at Belfer Center's Intelligence Project. And Rory Cormack, Professor of Inter International Relations, Director of Research and Knowledge Exchange, and Director of the Center for the Study of Subversion, Unconventional Interventions and Terrorism at the University of Nottingham. Thank you both for joining me today. Thank you to the audience for joining all of us. I think this will be a really interesting conversation, a very timely one. So not to waste any time, why don't we just start off with Beth? Um, these issues are trending right now. This has been an issue for quite some time. Can you talk a little bit about what the, some of the trends are that we are seeing on, on disinformation these days? Uh, and I, excuse me, because I have a, a cold today, so I may sound kind of froggy. I, I'm interested also in, in getting Rory's perspective on these things because he's a, a true uh, current expert. But, you know, as I was looking at um, disinformation today, I, I kind of pulled out three key trends that I'm watching myself. Um, one is that I think China is using more aggressive, confrontational, and surreptitious tactics. And, um, you know, and those are really centered on its top targets, Taiwan, the US and the UK and Australia. And, and I think that this is partly because their efforts to apply kind of a, uh, maybe gentler influence efforts have not really borne fruit. I mean, in most countries in the world, China is less popular today than, than for a very long time. And so they are turning now to um, using intimidation by diplomats, cyberbullying, um, manipulation by um, influencers and in social media. And we're seeing a lot of targeted disinformation campaigns as well. And, um, you know, so, so things are kind of shifting. Um, you know, compared to 2020 um, before the pandemic. Um, or, and so one of the other things that I think um, is important in this sphere is that, you know, when I was really closely watching this in the 2016 and, and 2020 elections, China wasn't uh, involved in um, election interference. And there's no sign right now that they are involved in interference, but we certainly are starting to see efforts um, potentially that are around influence. And, um, and I just would note that, you know, over the past month, um, we've had NSA and FBI put out alerts because they've had a hundred, more than a hundred Republican and Democratic state um, party domains uh, being scanned by the Chinese. Now, you know, scanning ha happens all the time. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to do something, but I think we really have to watch that. The second thing is um, the shift from, you know, really focusing on bots. You know, this was, you know, Russia's main method was social media um, in 2016. And I think that in 2020 and now more with, um, with China, we're seeing the use of um, local media uh, in, in different countries and local influencers. Um, by local, I don't mean by cities, um, although that can happen. I mean, you know, national as well, um, in order to propagate the information. And a lot of that is just because it's, it's a lot harder to use and manipulate social Western social media. And so these influencers and, and using people um, and to parrot and push out their talking points um, is, is a really significant thing. Um, I was just reading a China, um, a China report by Freedom House, which I would recommend to everybody. It just came out this past, this month. Um, and they talked about how China in particular is using local media and um, kind of capturing local media in some cases. So in 130, um, different outlets across 30 country, countries, um, they're providing Chinese content and then they're obscuring that content. And I know also, you know, in 2020, we saw Iran exploiting local newspapers um, to, in order to influence voters. And then the, the last thing I'll pick up is, you know, this is a trend that has really been accelerating since the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, but um, we're seeing 
our adversaries picking up and amplifying the disinformation being promoted by each other. So these interconnections and overlaps between Russian and Chinese and sometimes Iranian um, uh, disinformation campaigns. So, you know, this kind of started, I think, I look back at the COVID origins campaign as being one of the primary, you know, singular events where we started to see that promoted both by Russia and um, by China that COVID or originated in a U.S. lab. Um, and then, um, you know, I think now with the war, we're seeing a lot of different themes being promoted by these actors from, you know, the general um, idea of Russia, Ukraine, and, and, and the role of each in the war and who's to blame, um, the threat of nuclear war, um, you know, all of the anti-Western messages has, have just been ramped up. And those are focused um, not just in kind of the usual suspects, but we're seeing that promulgation throughout the global South. And, you know, one of the things that has happened, it's kind of a fourth theme is, I guess, is that there has been quite a bit of investment in the global South by both Russia and China over the past few years. And, um, and they have been pretty successful in, um, in having their messages dominate um, the discourse in media, in large media um, outlets. Um, and I'll just stop there. Oh, thanks, Beth. Turning to you, Rory, um, Beth introduced some of the current issues that are going on with, with disinformation. Can you talk about continuity and change? Um, how has the internet era affected information operations? Well, the obvious thing to say is to look at the impact in terms of scope and scale and speed of some of these operations, particularly around the, the, the social media side of things, which, as Beth mentioned, is like being overtaken a little bit by other, other types of, uh, of operations. But this is um, high tempo, it's brash, it's louder than it might have been in the past. It also allows a bit more micro-targeting than in the past. I mean, if you think about analog propaganda from the, old, from the Cold War, for example, this would have been inserting a, you know, a newspaper, an article into a newspaper, and it would go to an entire community. Whereas the era of big data and computational propaganda allows those themes to be targeted at a much more micro level, playing on an, an individual's hopes, dreams, fears, worries, rather than more bluntly as, a, as an entire um, community. And I think it's also uh, quite difficult to control the narrative now in the internet era, where there are so many different channels, a proliferation of, of um, you know, accounts, blurred lines between producers and consumers. Everyone now is a blogger or a vlogger or a micro journalist. So in the, the old days, so to speak, if you could control a couple of key radio stations or a couple of key newspapers, then you had a, a captive audience. Nowadays, I think that's, that's much more difficult. But there is, and this is the historian in me, there's as much continuity as there is change. I think the means might be changing a bit, um, but the purpose is actually remarkably stable. Some of the aims and the principles are remarkably stable, not just you know, over the last 70 years, but, but even before. States use this to discredit. States use this to divide. States use these means to try to find a existing schism in society and smash it open and polarize and divide and sow discord. And none of this is new. The means are changing, but the some of the core principles are actually remarkably similar. And I was reading some British Foreign Office documents from the 1960s recently, and they're talking about counter disinformation. They're using the same language we, we use today. And I found it, I found it really, really quite striking. And of course, the shift as Beth was outlining towards local influences and real people and, uh, and, and local newspapers. I mean, this is obviously not new. Again, um, it's, a, it's a shift since the focus on social media, uh, of, of course, it is, a, it is a current trend. At the same time, states have been using local media, local influences to try and target and exploit local knowledge and local conditions for as old as states have, have existed. 
So it is clearly a, an important current trend, um, but, it's the, but it's also very, very long standing. And I think one of the things that we as, as scholars and as practitioners need to do is to um, look back and learn some of these, these lessons. We, we've, been, we've been doing this for a, for a very long time. Thanks, you, you introduced my next question very nicely. Now that we're thinking, we've got the trends and sort of the historical context, how do we, how does this, the, the, this media landscape, this fragmented media landscape that I think you both have articulated, how does it affect our ability to, to counter influence operations? Beth, do you wanna respond yeah, to that? Yeah, I, I think Rory absolutely introduced this perfectly. Um, polarization and disinformation are reinforcing concepts, right? Um, you know, we no longer have three television networks in the United States where people get their news. Um, now we gravitate toward media that reflects and reinforces our preconceived notions and biases. And, you know, that allows, as Rory was saying, the adversary to tailor make content that will exploit and exacerbate those biases and the polarization. Um, I also think that, uh, you know, because it's hard for the adversary to focus on on this really fragmented media landscape, they can't hit every single one of these things. And it brings me back to the idea of the influencers being so important because each influencer is present on multiple platforms, um, you know, social media and regular media. As, and, and so, you know, by going after an individual or using an individual, they can disperse that message across multiple platforms in a really effective way and kind of hit some of the same people um, and you know, who would be listening to that influencer. So you know, I think that, that is, those are the two things that kind of come to mind. Rory, did you want to add? Yeah, I, just, I, I, I entirely agree. I would just add that it, one of the, the trends I think is that it's becoming increasingly difficult to build up a state's own overarching positive narrative um, because of this proliferation and multiple echo chambers and fragmented media landscape. And therefore what we're seeing is certain states just putting out, and Russia's an example with this so-called um, fire hose of falsehoods, just spamming and putting out lots and lots of different, often com competing and contradictory messages. And they're not expecting everybody to believe all of those messages because you, you couldn't, they are, they are literally uh, contradictory. But it just, it's, the trend is it's becoming you know, more, more negative. It's about sowing confusion, sowing discord. And the aim, I think, in, in, as a consequence of this um, fragmented landscape is to chip away at the West's narrative, the West's truth, um, instead of, kind of countering with a coherent message of, of, of its own, uh, hostile states are just making audiences question the veracity of all information, just is sowing cynicism. And I think that is, is, a, is a consequence of the, of the fragmented media landscape. Instead of being able to control everything or lots of things and, and, and build a coherent narrative, it's actually easier sometimes just to sow a bit more chaos and chip away, undermine trust in in the media, undermine trust in democratic institutions. Uh, it's a bit more kind of chaos theory, and 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 see what happens. And the the the, the aim is to ensure or to try and make it so that uh, audiences question uh, other bits of information and they end up in a state of polarized um, polarized paralysis, which hostile states can then exploit. Um, so I think that kind of negative angle is also a consequence of, of, the, of the fragmentation, the kind of double-edged sword, as what Beth outlined, but also as a more negative, disruptive angle to it as well. They're coming at us from both sides. This is frightening. You have both established a frightening tableau here. So how do we confront this? How do we, how do we, what, what is the best means to confront uh, disinformation operations? Is it exposure? What other tools are effective in, in, in handling or starting to uh, grapple with the situation? Beth? Well, I do think that exposure is absolutely key. And I, and I do think that um, there is some hope in, in that um, people are, when you compare where we are now to 2016, um, people are so much more aware of this issue. 
And it doesn't really matter in some ways, like what side of, of the debate you're on. I mean, people are, they may point at, at, you know, the other part of the polarization landscape as being, you know, involved in it or whatever, but, but I think that people are, are looking for it. And so I, I think that that exposure has been, you know, in many ways, very effective. Um, I do think that one of the things we need to do much more of is regulate social media. Um, I, I think that, you know, they're still operating perhaps on, you know, some of the basis of promoting um, thing, uh, ideas that exacerbate tensions. And, and I, even though they're getting better at it too, I just think that the whole idea of transparency and accountability needs to be somehow um, regulated a little bit more. And frankly, I think that the publics now are understanding enough that there's a lot of support for that. Um, it's just really hard to do. Um, and then, you know, for my Intel background, I would say that, you know, there's, there's also the potential um, to confront and potentially deter through cyber operations itself. Um, I don't know how effective these kinds of things are, but I know it makes people feel good. So I think we're going to see more of it. But, you know, I'll remind people that in 2018, Cyber Command um, blocked internet access to Russia's IRA and, you know, and then sent um, direct messages to the different um, operatives who were behind the influence campaigns and warned them, like, we know who you are and you shouldn't be doing this. Uh, signaling, you know, that Washington was willing and able to impose some sort of cost. You know, again, I'm not sure how effective that is overall, but I do think we're going to see more um, offensive cyber responses to this sort of thing. And, you know, and we're also seeing a lot of prosecutions from the FBI, and I, and I applaud that. Um, the sanctions, personally, I don't think are that useful, but um, it makes people feel good, I guess. <laughs> Rory? I think there's definitely a, a role to play for the kind of operations which, which Beth was, was outlining. As long as people are aware of the uh, strengths and limitations of what these things can and cannot achieve in, this, in the cyber world, I hear a lot about you know cyber war and cyber Armageddon and big red cyber buttons that can do X, Y, and Z. And people who know way more about cyber than me assure me that None, none, none of that is remotely the case. Um, so I, I think there is a there's a there's a role for offensive and counteroffensive um, covert operations in the information sphere, and I, I certainly think it's an important part of the state's uh, arsenal. Um, and it's got to be it's got to be used very carefully, as, as, as Beth was uh, alluding to. I also agree that exposure is, is the key tool. I mean, it's the one that um, is, is is gained the most traction over the last few years and become the centerpiece of of many states' uh, um, response to, to some of this. But I think that that exposure has got to be calibrated very, very carefully. I think it's a bit, it's a bit simplistic for people to say, let's you know, shine a light. And that's kind of kind of enough. You know, the kind of modernist idea of the truth will set you free. I think that we need, given the, given the echo chambers, the polarization, the people interpreting this stuff through uh, through their own prisms and ideology and people um, seeing the fact checking and just thinking that it's all part of a, a conspiracy against them and Twitter are part of the liberal elite and it, it's, it's, it's all it's all um, it's all working against them. I think we need to think quite carefully because many of these operations are designed or at least as a secondary aim, to, to be exposed. Like they, they, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that they failed because we are exposing them. And um, if we expose them, we end up either drawing attention to the issue, we end up just spreading more confusion, we end up, um, sometimes if it's you know, a forgery and, the, and the, the target state issues a denial, that denial can be witnessed by way more people than read the actual forgery. And, uh, and draw attention to the state's initial um, response, which is what the, 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 the adversary wants to do. Um, and I think there's been a, one of the downsides of exposure over the, la over the last few years is there's a risk of talking up the potency 
of some of these operations. A couple of British intelligence chiefs spoke publicly last year about this, and they said that, that bigging up Putin's influence operations was doing his dirty work for him because everyone you know, talking about Russian propaganda here, disinformation there, it's it's it, it, it gives oxygen to what otherwise might have been a pretty rubbish disinformation campaign. It risks um, undermining, sowing confusion, and something like Discord, and doing doing exactly what Putin wants to do. Because suddenly everyone's everyone's thinking, "Oh, is this Russian disinformation? Or how can we trust this? Is it all part of an information war? Are the West lying?" And there's a there's a risk that if we don't if we don't expose it in a very carefully thought through way, that it ends up uh, potentially becoming counterproductive and people just end up becoming cynical and end up believing nothing at all, which is you know, occasionally what the, um, what the adversaries want. So I think exposure is really important, but it has to be calibrated quite carefully by, I don't know, focusing on the, the actor rather than the narratives. So you're not drawing attention to the particular, particular narrative by pointing, if you're gonna expose it, point to the, the weaknesses of these operations. Don't portray, I mean, Putin is some sort of omnipotent grand chess master playing 4D chess across Europe. I think that that image has been smashed a bit over the last year as a consequence of, of the, uh, the illegal invasion of Ukraine. But certainly up to that, there was this image that you know, he was brilliant at covert operations and manipulating across across Europe. And maybe that's maybe that's not the case. Maybe that's a consequence of us talking things up a little bit too much on occasion. Sometimes it's important. Also, can we expose do we expose just one information, like one operation, a bunch of operations? And do, do we do it together? Is there a risk of doing them individually that we create a boiling frog scenario where people kind of they're not bothered about one, the next one they're not bothered about, the next one they're not bothered about, and all of, and then before we realize it, you know, things are uh, um, we're, we're in deep water. And then who does the exposure? Is this done by media outlets being briefed? Is it being done by governments issuing official communications? Is it being done but more discreetly? They're briefing, I don't know, industry or academia. So I think exposure is very, very important, um, but we need to think very carefully about how we calibrate it and who does it to ensure that we don't end up uh, falling into traps and being counterproductive. I just wanna add just one little quick thing. I mean, this is certainly things that the government um, the intel community and the law enforcement community and the policy community in the U.S. Um, you know has grappled with for some time. I mean, it was part of many conversations about you know whether we do that exposure or not, and what does it mean? And you know, in some of the exposures I was involved with, you know, had surprising responses. Like when we exposed the Iranian effort to influence the 2020 election. And there were all these people who were like, well, you're just doing that because you want to distract from all the things Russia's doing. And it's like, no, we're just trying to say that there are other actors out there. And, and this is a campaign that, um, that people should be aware of. And so, you know, all these things have consequences that even when you think it through, you, you're kind of like, oh, well, what happened here? <sighs> um, to the audience out there, please, uh, Feel free to put your questions in the box. We'll get to those as soon as we finish our conversation. Uh, these are all fascinating points. I think there's a point too to, to think about, which is the receptivity of the audience to these operations. And so um, do either of you want to jump in on, on how do we counter the, the popular false narratives? How do we engage with the population to, to affect the receptivity to these messages? Beth, I, I can, I, yeah, I can go. I can go first if you okay. want to. Oh no, yeah. sorry, come, come back. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, whenever whenever I think about like the government role and stuff, I think about Ronald Reagan's words. Um, I'm from the government, and I'm here to help. And he called those the nine most frightening words in the English language. And of course, as a super dedicated and hardworking civil servant, it like pains me. But like the fact is that. Um, as Rory was saying, there's, you know, people don't necessarily believe the government anymore. So, so there's a role for the government to play in some of this, but I also think that, you know, mainly it's about, you know, how do we create um, the societal resilience and it's got to come more from civil society and the mobilization of citizens 
and um, and using kind of like more trusted messengers that are that span across these polarized divides um, and and make sure that you know there are people who actually call out when good things the government does or bad things or whatever but um, we need we need we need good journalism um, we need fact checkers we need researchers we need people like Rory um, and I think that there's some good examples um, in Finland and the Baltics of of doing kind of the civic education and mobilization but I think it's a lot easier in those smaller societies than it might be in the United States. Rory? It's, it's, a, it's, the, it's the difficult answer, isn't it? It's the long, it's because it's such a long term um, project to build that resilience, to educate, you know, to, to ensure that we are properly funding education, not just um, tertiary education, but right down to, to primary school levels. I mean, it, it, it drives me mad when we're talking about you know, the need to counter disinformation. And at the same time, we are, I say we in the UK, uh, cutting humanities and arts and histories and the study of music. And people don't realize that people who are you know, trained in musicology, for example, are very, very good at analyzing sources and being able to, um, being able to, to, to show critical awareness. But this is, this is a, a, a decades long project, which requires a, a whole of governments, indeed whole of society approach. All these things have to, have to be joined up. And similarly, we need to, as, you know, uh, as Beth was saying, that, it's, that there are, it preys on existing divisions in society. We as society need to get our own houses in order and start to um, debate these divisions in a less toxic manner to um, try and heal some of these rifts on these divisions because hostile information operations can only be successful when they are exploiting existing um, toxicity and, and schisms. So if we in the UK and US can uh, improve uh, the, the status of uh, this big ass to improve society, but at least if we can improve the way in which we debate some of these issues in a less angry and, and toxic manner, then I think, I think that would help. In the more immediate term, because I appreciate it's very easy for an academic to sit here and say invest in the invest in the humanities, invest in invest in history. Although I do strongly, strongly believe that. Um, I think we need the partners to want to counter the disinformation and the false narratives, and um, particularly you know the big media agencies, whether it's social media. And Beth was talking about difficulties with that earlier, or whether it's you know, major newspapers or television channels. I mean, I can't uh, comment on, on, on the US, um, but over here, you know, this is being peddled by some of the big newspapers that everyone's reading. And we, we need to ask, well, wh why are they peddling this stuff? Um, who's, who's funding these, these, these people? Why, why are a couple of um, non-domiciled tax evaders in the UK running a bunch of newspapers? It's, there, 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 there are questions there. So we need, I, I completely agree, that this can't just come from government because amongst the target audience, amongst the people we need to cut through to, they're the ones who probably hold the government in the, in the lowest regard uh, and, and will, will make me very suspicious. So we need um, partners. We need to work through different people. But we also need to you know, make sure that these, these big agencies, these big platforms are, are willing to do that and that's a bit of social media regulation is a bit of you know, regulation around who funds the press around monopoly of press ownership all those kind of things i think i think need to be uh need to be looked at and then finally and even more immediate term we need to think about how we do the whole kind of impartial balancing act between on the you know, when we're doing debates on the, on the radio or on or on um, cable news um I think what's important is that is the perspectives um, that are based, I don't know, on on, on unequal evidence do not get an, um, equal airtime, and even our most trusted sources at home in the UK, BBC, uh, have been guilty of this. They, they they're so obsessed with um, impartiality that they will have someone arguing X and someone arguing Y, and one of those Ys might be a 
one of those words might be a climate change denier, I don't know, but they get a prominent airtime alongside a climate change scientist. And we need to be bolder in being able to challenge that a little bit. I think we're running scared. We're running from some of our most trustworthy and biggest institutions on whom we rely to, to keep us informed are running so scared of being accused of a lack of impartiality that, that they're not um, challenging people. They're not providing enough context. They're not calling out lies. And they're giving too much airtime, frankly, to fringe actors and bring them into the mainstream. And I think it's, it, it, it's, it's problematic. One thing I wouldn't do though, I wouldn't ban Dis, uh, things that are dis, we, we consider to be disinformation. I think that ends up in a, a, a very difficult uh, area, which, which I certainly wouldn't advocate, but we need to treat these people espousing uh, false information in a, in a more, careful, more, more careful manner. So let's turn to one last question because we've got a large list of questions from the audience to get to as well. Um, one could argue um, that we're we're really looking at a new era of the public use of intelligence um, in 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 Ukraine right now in the conflict in Ukraine. How has what I would call strategic declassification affected information operations? Beth, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, I think that it has been a you know a really big deal. Um, it this idea of pre bunking um, is is new. I, I think it's really unprecedented based on the, you know, the scale and duration of this campaign and it's continued beyond Russia, Ukraine. And I, I think that it's different, you know, people compare it to the Cuban Missile Crisis, but that was exposing, um, that was exposing a falsehood that was already out there. And this is designed to take, you know, in advance and say, this is what you're going to hear and setting the stage then for understanding when you hear it, what it means. And, and to me, I think that this should be used for, you know, across the board as much as possible. It doesn't have to just be about intelligence, but about facts, about like, this is how you know, to the local election official going out and explaining um, on as much media as possible, this is how our elections are secured. These are how your ballot counting works and trying to be very transparent and fact-based before there is a crisis. Because once the crisis happens, it's very hard to walk back or erase, you know, in people's neurons what they've already heard. Um, it becomes rather sticky. And so I, I love this idea of trying to get out in front of, of things we know are coming and, and also things we're, we're just worried about. It's the, it's the preemption, isn't it? There's, there's, the, there's the novelty in this. And you know, I love to try and be, <laughs> sometimes I end up being that annoying smug historian saying, oh yeah, actually there are precedents to all of this stuff and it's, it's all happened before and, it's, and the historians can be incredibly irritating like that. Um, but I completely agree with you, Beth, you're, you're, you're bang on. But um, this getting out there in front is, is new. Um, there's a little bit of it um, done through covert channels back in um, Cold War time to, to preempt, but the, 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 the time moved more slowly back then, I think. Um, so that preemption was more difficult. Um, but the, the, there was some strategic declassification of materials uh, around um, you know, various issues in the 60s and 70s and 80s to, but they, and what they would do is create uh, you know, fake media agencies or fake, um, in this we talk about the UK again, fake think tanks we used to do quite a bit to get some of that out. And occasionally it would be in advance, it would try and be at the battle ahead of a particular, I don't know, Soviet front peace conference type thing. So there's a bit of, bit of rebuttal going on. But, the, but that was all done in an unattributable and an ambiguous manner for, for obvious reasons. What's really struck me, not only is not only the, the, the pre buttle getting out in front aspect, but also the, the owning it aspect, the fact that this is openly declassified uh, in, intelligence. And again, that is, as, 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 you, as you know, <laughs> very, very rare. Um, I, I suppose I would ask you what, what you think. Uh, is this going to become a new, 
a new normal? And is is there a risk that if it, if it becomes if it if it becomes a new normal and it's expected, when it doesn't become forthcoming for whatever reason, if the source is too classified or whatever, do you think that might end up having a negative effect where people will then start to assume government's lying or whatever because they haven't pre-butted something? Do you think, do you think it creates, creates unrealistic and unreasonable expectations going forward? I, I do. I mean, I think that, that one of the things that's different here is that it is a policy decision to use intelligence to pre-bunk, um, you know, coming issues. And, and so that policy means that it is here to stay, in my view, and the success of it around Russia, Ukraine, um, I think, you know, is kind of understood. And so they'll want to repeat it. I think people who say that it didn't succeed because it didn't stop Putin from invading don't know very much about like what Putin was going to do. Nothing would have really stopped him, in my view. Um, I do think that there are dangers, multiple dangers to doing this. And, you know, one is, is I guess, you know, setting these expectations. Um, there's another twist to that, which is you telegraph something's going to happen and it doesn't happen. And then people start questioning like, well, you know, how good is your intelligence? Or, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, and th that was attempted a little bit in Russia's case, but you know I don't think that worked because the overall idea was absolutely true, even though he changed tactics. There was no false flag operation that would have served as a pretense for why he was a rationale for going into Ukraine. That didn't happen. And the reason it didn't happen, I think, is because it was exposed. And so sometimes actors are going to change their tact because you've called it out. And if that happens over and over again, people are gonna say like, you just don't know what you're talking about. Um, there's some risk to credibility and trust. And I think that that's what you're getting at. And, um, and that's, that's a problem. I also think that they're, I, I'm guessing, I don't know this because um, I'm not in government anymore, but I suspect that the processes for deciding what should be released are not as refined um, as they probably should be and that there needs to be, in my view, um, a, very, a very substantial intelligence community ability to say no, um, because you know, when you get um, a government person in who might not be as knowledgeable about the intelligence community or, um, you know, doesn't care, um, then you could have all sorts of things happening. And so I would say to the intelligence community and the policy community that now is the time to really lock in um, a, a strict, um, standard and process for how to decide what to release and what not to release um, and because otherwise it could it could be quite dangerous um, in in different administrations thank you we'll turn to the questions from the audience we have quite a number um, to you out there please continue submitting your questions we'll try to get through as many as possible um so throw this out to to you both beth and rory what are your opinions about a strategic level or national mechanism to coordinate information and influence including defense against disinformation versus current efforts beth do you want to try that one first uh well congress has you know, has required, mandated that a um, malign influence center be set up in the Office of the Director of National Intelligence to coordinate, um, you know, all the analysis and that's going on and, and to work with the policy community on that. Um, like, if you're talking about a government, like, misinformation czar, um, you know, like the drugs are or whatever. Um, I, I do think, I mean, I'm, I'm wary of bureaucracies <laughs> having served in them. You know, I think that they are, 
they're dangerous beasts and they're hard to tear down. Um, but but the point here is that this is a whole of government effort is required, but not just for each individual country. It's really a whole of Western societies that needs to be thinking about sharing information, collaborating. And there's been progress on that. Certainly NATO um, is, is working on that. Um, I visited um, in Finland, the um, EU led effort there, which uh, they're fantastic. Um, I thank German Marshall Fund for sponsoring that study trip that I went on. It was fabulous. Um, so there are things that are happening there, but I think we're still kind of at a nascent period and that is where we should go. So, so I totally agree. Uh, international sharing and collaboration around this is so important, particularly as certain countries in Central Eastern Europe have a, you know, a long track record of dealing with this stuff, encountering this stuff, and, and um, we should be working with them and, and, and learning from them. Uh, uh, the, 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 the thing that I would warn against is any kind of bureaucracy that looks like it's some sort of truth police or it can be framed as some sort of truth police. Nothing should, be, nothing should have a remit where it gets to say what is and what is not disinformation because that can become politicized so, so quickly and end up very quickly becoming um, counterproductive. So any kind of mechanism which coordinates a, a whole of government or international response is a good thing. Anything called the counter disinformation unit um, with a remit to, to, to do this, I think is, is, is dangerous. Can I just add to that too? I really think that we need to look beyond kind of the usual suspects of allies in dealing with this. The countries that need help the most are, you know, in the global south. Um, some of them are, you know, closely allied to us, um, some aren't. But I mean, I really think we need to be thinking about. Um, as Rory said, not like being the truth police and like always wagging our finger and saying that, you know, Russia and China are lying about X, Y, and Z, um, but maybe it's about more training and recognition and how do you develop um, civil society and, and all of that. But I, I really worry because we are seeing how effective um, that campaign has been in many ways in the Russia-Ukraine war. And there's been a lot of investment over many, many years that have brought them to this position. Great, here's another question. Does corporate acquisition of local news impact vulnerability of local news outlets to being used in disinformation campaigns? I, I think absolutely. Um, you know, the, the sorry state of local um, newspapers in this country, it's very bad. Um, they're all in financial uh, trouble. And um, when they're obtained by these large corporations, they are turned into, um, you know, debt manufacturing organizations. And, and so, you know, they fire people and they become even more desperate and they don't have capacity, right? They don't have beat reporters and, and investigative journalists. And, and so there's, there's a real problem in our country with um, the degradation of local news and these big corporate buyouts by, by um, companies that don't have public interest in mind. These are, these are businesses. Um, and so I, I, am, I don't know what we do about that. Maybe Rory knows, but I, I I'm, I'm, I'm definitely agree with that question. And it goes, it goes even bigger than that, I think. The, 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 the entire model of, of journalism is, is, is undermining the role of decent investigative journalists, whether that's at local level or at, even at national level. I think so much of journalism now is about clickbait headlines. You know, any, any, anything that is, is, particularly when it's online, because people don't pay for you know, print media anymore. When the the funding model is, you know, you're paid by number of clicks that your website or your, your news story gets because that's where the adverts are. Um, that is automatically going to skew how one is reporting a particular story. And the headline will be sensationalist um, to get you to, to click. 
And I, I, you know, we, you see that not just at local level, um, I, I completely agree with all your points about local level stuff, but I think it also increases to, expands up to national level sometimes as well, where this is about, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a business. It's about how, how we can make up for the fact that newspapers, even good ones, um, are losing money. And they're, you know, they're some of the best newspapers, the ones with reputations for great investment journalists, holding people to account, telling the truth, et cetera. Are, are struggling in, in, in this day and age because of the disruption caused by the, 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 caused by the internet to their, their financial structures. And that is having a very negative impact on their ability to do the kind of stuff that we need them to do in order to um, counter some of this, uh, some of this stuff. And also with the buyouts of local newspapers, we're seeing increasing uh, syndicalization, where it's this kind of what we, we over here call churnalism. They just churn out stuff over and over again. And every single news, local newspaper just picks up the same thing and just repeats it without fact checking it, without doing anything. Um, again, because it's quick, it's cheap, it's easy. And I think that, again, is, is problematic. So it's the, it's the financial model of the entire um newspaper industry unfortunately and it's been declining since the 1970s so there's again there's no there's no quick easy fix so um often the discussions about uh disinformation and we've discussed this here in this in this panel focus on public as the target can you speak to what's happening with efforts that target the government the military intelligence community those types of targets beth this may be a good one for you Huh. Um, well, I mean, clearly in 2020, we had a situation where, um, you know, influencers uh, around the Trump administration were targeted. Um, and, you know, they didn't necessarily know it. Right. And then they became, you know, the, pe the people who said all this stuff. Um, so, you know, we, we definitely have some examples of that. I mean, it has been a Chinese um, playbook to go after officials to influence them regarding um, China policy um, at all levels of the US government from local, local government to, you know, state and national level government. I mean, this is just a, an absolute playbook and China has the resources and the personnel to do the kinds of targeting and then exploitation and they invest very early in someone's career um, sometimes and follow people for decades and so you know this has been going on for a long time and I you know I would suggest that every intel organization in the world goes after military people and it's starting to move away in this kind of discussion, away from disinformation and information type operations towards wider covert political influence operations where, and what, you, what, what you're outlining, Beth, isn't it? It's, it's, it's the political influence stuff rather than spreading disinformation. Um, I mean, obviously, they are different points on a, on a similar scale of, of covert actions. Um, I've just, just I've made one conceptual academic point, which may or may not be of, be of interest, which is that uh, Oftentimes, a covert operation, or including information operations, they might they have different audiences. They might be intended to be untraceable or to public audiences, but they might well um, expect the, you know, the government, the counterintelligence agencies of the, the of the target, to be aware of what's of what's going on. And there's a bunch of academic literature out recently, which I think is really interesting talking about these different audiences and saying that states um, can kind of covertly communicate with each other sometimes using um, covert operations, knowing that the counterintelligence will, will pick it up. And it's a way of you know, signaling, of expressing preference, a um, bit of leverage, but trying to keep it backstage, trying to keep it uh, away from the cameras and away from uh, escalation ramps. Uh, and I think, just thinking about what we mean by secrecy, what we mean by exposure, what we mean by audiences, it's obviously, as, as you well know, but it's much more, much more nuanced than is something secret or not secret. It's something here you know, over as in code. There's a whole spectrum here, and in the at least in the popular understanding of this, that gets overlooked quite a lot. 
in favor of truth versus lie, open versus secret. And actually there's a, a whole range of um, different points on that, on that graph, if you like. So here's a rather dark question. Um, do you think that, that many people have already been lost and that they can no longer be reached by arguments on disinformation? Or is there a way back? Either one of you. Shall I go first this time? Sure. It's, it's easy, easy going second. I was listening to Beth's great answers and then just singing a little desk hat. It's great. I'm, enjoy, I'm, I'm enjoying myself. Um, <laughs> I would say that you're never going to, you, you know, you, you're never going to reach everybody and all, this, all the fact checking in the world. It, the amount of tailored individual uh, approach, long term individual approach to talk someone around, it, it, takes, a, it takes a long time. And you know, I was reading research recently about uh, bringing people back from the, the depths of conspiracy theories. And it takes uh, a lot of, you know, you've got, it's got to be family members doing it over a long, long time in a way that is uh, inclusive and not kind of ber berating or belittling. It's, it's very difficult. So I think for a government to be able to do that en masse is nigh on impossible. We can uh, offer you know, guidance, build civil society, try and, try and offer the tools, but I think it's impossible to, to, to reach everybody. Um, therefore, the aim should be to work out well, who, who are the influences that the states can reach? How can we kind of chip away people, you know, ch ch chip away people that we, 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 who are sufficiently, not sufficiently down the rabbit hole to be brought back and just kind of do it gradually, just chipping away at that massive audience, knowing that some of them will always be unreachable. I mean, we've got to be realistic about this. There probably are some cases, Rory, that you've looked at in terms of terrorism and, um, you know, the de-radicalization um campaigns or or programs and some have been effective and some have you know pretty effective uh singapore i think is one um that i would point to and some have been really not effective and certainly there have been controversies in the uk about about some specific cases where people say like what the hell happened here this person went out and shot more people so I, I, you know, I do think that there, there is potential there, but like the success of the Singapore program, in my view, was that it is so specific, tailored, you are with an individual, just like you were saying, Rory, and it's like, you know, you can't do that at scale. So again, it gets back to kind of society and um, and and hopefully growing smarter people <laughs> from elementary school on primary school. My kid's six. I don't know what grade that is in America, but they're just they're just starting to do um, online safety, and they're learning about YouTube algorithms and the dangers of letting it play because it can end up taking you down dark rabbit warrens, uh, which I thought was super interesting. At six years six years old, it's good. Uh, we'll just do one last question. Um, should we and how can we educate influencers about this topic and about how to spot when they're being pushed to promote an idea? Rory, do you want to start it first again? Yeah, we should. Um, I think that this thing has got to be done without the, the heavy hand of government, putting an arm around somebody and making it, as, as Beth said earlier, the, the, Reagan, the Reagan quote. Um, but I think it's part of building up that general awareness and responsibilities and regulating social media a little bit so that when people are influencing, we have to, you know, we, 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 we know that they are influencing. Obviously, there's the, the, the advertising debates just is settled ish now about how we tag um, influencers who are advertising. Um, and I, I think there's a similar debate around um, if, if you, how, in, increasing awareness of these people and, and, and where they may or may not get their money from. Um, and, but it's, it's, it's part of the broader approach around increasing awareness amongst influencers and amongst the audience. It's about increase, it's building civil society. It's giving people the tools and the capacity to be able to spot an influencer and think I'm being influenced. 
Um, and that comes back to the, the long-term education and all that kind of thing. I think it would be myopic to take a, you know, a, a government training course or something on disinformation for influencers, because I, I don't think that'll work. It's an easy option, but it's the longer term, more difficult things that are gonna make the difference eventually. You know, I think about um, Elon Musk and uh, his recent peace proposal around Russia. And then there was quite a backlash. And then there was an exposure by someone saying like, he talked to Putin before he put this out. And so we are seeing reactions by civil society um, in, in calling people out when it's somebody important. I think that um, someone prominent like that, but there's a lot of influencing going on with our kids and, and, you know, the demographic of, of kind of twenties and, and 30 somethings. And I'm not sure that there are enough people kind of engaged to like, no, and, 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 you know, there's a lot going on. Um, so, I, I think it's possible, and I do think that it's about vigilance um, of civil society to do to do a lot of that work. And I also think the government should, for major people, go behind the scenes and pull people aside and say, like, uh, you realize that what you're doing is, um, you know, the dirty work for so and so. Do you understand that they're feeding you lies? Um, because they don't always. You know, or sometimes they're just cynical. So I don't know. <laughs> great. Thank you both for your great contributions. Um, Rory, congratulations on your new book. He's just published a book on covert action called How to Stage a Coup for our listeners out there. Um, thank you both again. And thanks to our audience out there for the fantastic questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all. Um, but I think we've we've covered quite a lot of the major issues. So thank you both. Thank all of you for joining us today.